So, Rusty, again, thank you so much for joining us on Infamous Horror. It's like I grew up with your work all my life. So, thank you for popping on. (laughs) No problem, buddy. Good to be here. So, you've done the the Sapel show. You've done Tales from the Hood. This is pretty much your first science fiction film that you directed, right? So, how was it like making how was that like making that jump into the science fiction realm as well? Um, it, it was actually it was a lot of fun. And I, I hope that I get to do some other things in the, the sci-fi world. I mean, I like sci- science fiction. You know, I, I've kind of because of where my career started out, really got pegged in, on the, the comedy side. But um, I, I like, you know, I like uh, thrillers. I like sci-fi. Um uh obviously i like horror so but this you know the 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 connection for me to to anything is always kind of like what what's the story saying you know what what thematically uh what are we talking about and so you know one of the things that i've always enjoyed with sci-fi from you know being a kid and watching star trek and all that kind of stuff is is you know playing around with um themes of what it means to to be good to be human to be a person and you know you can do that in sci-fi and horror in ways that are sometimes more entertaining than you would do in a drama you know where it's just like everything's just laid out just like there's other layers you're still dealing with the same topics and so uh with this you know it was it was you know uh what's out there in the world that kind of speaks to me that I can play around with in terms of this uh, sci-fi, uh, the sci-fi tale that we're doing. Um, and once I connected to that, then, you know, I, I felt really comfortable, even though I hadn't done sci-fi before. It's like, well, I know what the story is. You worry about the story, but, you know, play around with the genre elements of, of the, of the sci-fi, uh, think so yeah and you had josh and morgan and greg and lovey all in this cast so how was it like being a director with those or directing them because it's got to be like putting icing on a cake as a director with that cast right i mean you just got to watch them act for the most part that's very true um you know uh josh uh josh and morgan um, having these two that, you know, are really consummate veteran actors. I mean, Josh has been acting since he was a kid. Um, it, it, it allowed us to really to get the movie done. I mean, when I first signed on to the film, they were saying, oh, we think you'll have 28 days or so. And I thought that that was tight. <laughs> we ended up having 18 days to shoot this. And oh, had wow. I, I, had I not had actors that, showed up really prepared every single time they stepped onto the set, we would have never been able to get, you know, this done. Um, as it was, we we did have to lose some scenes uh, out of the script um, to be able to accomplish, uh, uh, you know, the film and the, the time we had allotted. But the, the two of them, you know, it, Morgan as even... Am I saying especially, I guess, you know, when someone like that shows up on the set, the entire crew is suddenly like, we've got to do our best work. (laughs) (laughs) We can't be effing up right now. We got to really bring it. And, um, you know, Josh as well, because he's such a professional and that really makes such a difference in you know, how the crew works, how the actors underneath number one also uh, work on it on a day to day. You know, if your number one is is crazy and doing whatever, then everything underneath is going to also be a battle. Um, But he is a very intuitive actor. He's really smart. Um, And uh, so that that made it easy. And lovey, uh, lovey uh, Simone. Uh, who plays Jayla. Yeah, she really did a great job and and was, you know, also she showed showed up ready to work and uh, and and really put in the effort. Um, And and it was a tricky thing uh, with her and um, 
her and Josh because their relationship happened so fast. It's like you kind of have to buy that that, right. that, yeah. that works. Uh, and, you know, I, I let her character be, you know, not the aggressor, but she kind of takes the lead at the top of that because Josh has this moment where he's using the ring. If he had been the kind of super aggressor, you know, all the way through, he would have seemed so shady. Uh, yeah. But <laughs> because she <laughs> kind of offers up the kiss first that, and she kind of offers up this kind of romantic moment first that, you know, before it falls apart two or three times, um, you 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 kind of give him a pass with the ring uh, <laughs> in that scene that uh, they, they have at his apartment. And how did you come about adapting the short story, right? Because it already has a built-in audience from the fans of the story and the author itself. So whenever you do that, how is it like as a filmmaker trying to adapt that towards the general audience it already has and then making this a new narrative for fans that may not be aware of the story itself? Right. Yeah. I mean, it was it was tricky and it was a bit of a journey. And the journey started, you know, before I became involved with it. Uh, one of our producers, Tom Vitale, had read the short story, I think, when he was in high school and had always wanted to do something with it. And um, he reached out and got uh, I think the, the first draft was written by Macon Blair, who does really. Oh, good. wow. Yeah. Um, and that's the the initial script that I got was 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 Macon's and um he really went along with the darkness that was in the short story um so his characters you know I describe it like he if you if you remember uh, or if you ever watched um leaving Las Vegas with Nicolas Cage where he's an alcoholic and he just he just goes down the rabbit hole there's no saving this guy and that's kind of you know what the the original draft of 57 seconds that Macon did uh this guy gets the ring and he's a lot like the character in the short story Lucifer where he just it, it, he there's nothing redeeming about the guy um which is a story that I like you would probably like yeah. but <laughs> you're the you know the the companies that are buying things now are thinking about a mass audience and like you say um, people that don't know the short story or people that aren't necessarily genre fans. Uh, well, how do we reach them? So the trick for me, and that's when I became involved with it, was how to how to keep a lot of the elements and some of the darkness of the short story, but create a protagonist that we're rooting for at the same time. And so that was about giving uh, Franklin, Josh's character, Franklin, some sort of goal that he could then use the ring as a tool to achieve. Uh, and, you know, at the time, the whole Sackler um, uh, uh, Oxycontin thing was going on. And I was like, oh, you know, I, I knew some people that had had to go into rehab because of that stuff. Uh and I was like, okay, well, that could be a good thing for him to, you know, if, you know, so his sister, now we're saying his sister died because of this. So now he has at least a reason to go after somebody. And so now that gives us a villain for him to go after. And he can now use this ring as a means, once he finds it, as a means to, uh, to achieve, you know, this goal of taking this guy down. Um and then, you know, Morgan's character, the uh, um, Anton Burrell character, becomes this kind of angel character, like a spirit guide character, <laughs> right. which turns out to be, well, maybe, you know, he's got some issues, too. But uh, having this villain over here allows Franklin to kind of play in the middle of these two things. And, you know, he he becomes the, the vessel that is kind of, you know, his internal thing is, you know, uh, am I doing too much with this? I really enjoy this. Oh, you know, I, I, and he can feel the good. He, he deals with the good and the bad of the technology, which is a lot of what the film kind of deals with. Technology of drugs, the technology of uh, 
you know, all the things that we're getting now that allow us to monitor our health, deal with social media, all that kind of stuff. And he's kind of stuck between those those two those two between the good of that those things that can can create and the bad that they can also be used for. And what are you looking forward to the most of people getting out of 57 seconds? I, I would say it's that it's just to start questioning for for them themselves or thinking, you know, themselves like, oh, geez, yeah, I have, you know, I have uh, I have all this power in my hand because of just even a cell phone now. So, I, you know, I can create videos. I can put out texts. I can put out uh, I, I can put up things to help the world or I could put up things to help myself. Sometimes those two things go together. Sometimes they don't. Uh, and and I think that that's where I, what I'm hoping people kind of kind of start to mull over in their own heads. It's like, yo, know, how am I using the technology and the, and the tools that I have at my disposal? And where is the line where, you know, I become a bad guy or the technology is, you know, and it's usually us, you know, everyone's worried about right. AI, but it's how we use AI. <laughs> you know, if you, if you, if AI is just sitting in your computer on a desk, it's not doing anything, but it, it's how you program it and how you use it and how you manipulate it. All of our problems are always human problems for the most part. <laughs> uh, outside of earthquakes and that sort of thing. But yeah. Well, Rusty, thank you so much for taking the time and joining us on Infamous Horror. It's been so much fun talking to you and congratulations. Thank you, AJ. Love those posters.